If you're new with us today, we're in week two of a two-part series called Generous George. And the title of the message this morning is God Loves Multiplication. Now, maybe when some of you hear that, maybe you're a little bit like me and, and you're not the biggest fan of math. Anybody here not a huge math fan? Pastor Chris isn't in, in here to see this, okay? He's a math teacher, but I'm not the biggest fan of math. When I was younger, in like elementary school and grade school, I really liked math. I thought, you know, arithmetic, that's all, I'm, I'm good at it, it's as, it's as easy as a piece of cake. And then I got up to like pre-algebra. Oh, Pastor Chris heard. He heard me. I got up to pre-algebra and they started adding letters into the equations. Like, put the letter X in them. Like, how does X go with numbers? I don't, I don't understand this. And then you get up to geometry. And then once you get up to, like, pre-calculus, and they're starting to add Greek letters in there. And it was all Greek to me. I didn't know what the heck was going on. And so math just kept getting harder and harder and harder. And my love for math just kept waning more and more and more. And so I understand that when, when you hear that today we're talking about math and, and multiplication and, and mixing that together with a, a conversation about money, like some of you are ready to tap out right now. You're just like, I am out, I'm checking out, I'm going to take a nap. And I, I get it, I get it. But, but here's what I want to say. Even though we're going to be talking about multiplication today, I, I think I'm going to be able to, and I hope I'm going to be able to make this topic super simple enough for every one of us to understand because God truly does love multiplication. And we'll explain what that means here in just a minute. Now, how many of you, as, as we talk about this topic of generosity, how many of you, if you're being honest in your heart of hearts, and it's okay, we're all friends here, okay? Nobody's judging. But how many of you, you like stuff? You like your stuff, right? You, li you like stuff. You like to buy stuff. You love when you get your paycheck because that means you can buy more stuff. And if you somehow come across a windfall of money, like now you're rolling in stuff. Like you're, we love, as human beings, we love our stuff. And I am a recovering stuff addict, to be honest with you. I love stuff. I like buying stuff. I get excited about things. Now, I have learned that shopping means two different things between me and my wife, right? Shopping for, I actually like shopping because I like to go into the store, go right to the rack or go right to the section of the store where I know I'm going to buy something. I buy it, I, I get it, I take it to the register, I buy it and I leave. Like that's shopping to me. My wife, however, she likes to look around the entire store. That's shopping to my wife. She loves shopping in that way. So our definitions of shopping are different, but I like shopping. I like to buy stuff because I'm a stuff addict. Now, anybody here want to be honest and say, you know what, Pastor Thomas, I don't go into the store as much anymore because now I have discovered Amazon. Anybody an Amazon addict? And Amazon can be a little bit dangerous because Amazon, my wife always has her cart full in Amazon, and uh, it's dangerous if you go on the Amazon website or app because they got that little button that says buy now with one click. You got to be careful because you can buy your whole cart in one click now. So if you hit that thing by accident, I'm, I'm, as a Christian, I'm thinking, well, you know, if I accidentally hit that one click and I buy everything in my cart, does that mean it was God's will that I just bought all that stuff, that God ordained that to take place, and I, personally, I think that's bad theology, all right? That's just me. But when you look at the Bible, when you look at the 66 books of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, from cover to cover, God has a lot to say on the topic of money, on the topic of possessions. In fact, did you know that the topic of money and possessions comes up over 2,000 times in the pages of Scripture? In fact, the exact number is over 2,300 times. Over 2,300 times in the Bible, God addresses the topic of money and stuff, our possessions. And I think he does that so often in the scriptures because he knows that most human beings are addicted to stuff. And we want more stuff. So God cares a lot about this topic. And so if God cares a lot about this topic, we need to care a lot about this topic. Now, those of you who are parents, think back to when your first child was a newborn. 
Remember that happy time, right? They were so cute and cuddly and adorable. And then they, you know, they start to grow. And there comes a point in time, you know, somewhere in like the 15 to maybe 18 month range where this scenario pretty much plays out for every child. And how is that? What is the scenario that we're talking about? They're sitting with another child and there's a toy in between the two children and you're cute, adorable, right? No kid compares with your kid. Your kid is the bee's knees. They are the smartest kid, the cutest kid. And then you see your child looking at that toy, but the other child grabs the toy first. And then something inevitable happens. What? A fight breaks out, right? Your child then reaches out and grabs the toy out of the hand of the other child. And then one word comes out of their mouth. It's usually one of the first words that we ever speak. What is that word? Mine. And you see it early on in life that we as human beings are selfish. And we want stuff to be mine. And we want more. And we want it for ourselves. And that's the first glimpse for most people into this condition that even our children have this horrible illness that we might call sin cancer, right? Mine. And so we, we have this problem, and it starts early on in life. And we usually don't just grow out of it unless the Lord changes our hearts, unless the Lord gets a hold of our hearts, unless we give our heart to the Lord and give our stuff to God with open hands and say, God, everything that I have belongs to you. None of it's really mine, and when I'm gone, it's going to belong to somebody else. God, everything that I own is yours. When we come to God with open hands and a generous heart in that way, God can then begin to work to change us. And that's my prayer as we talk about this subject today. God speaks about money so often in Scripture because we all have a problem with selfishness. God knows that the number one thing competing for your heart in most cases is money. For most human beings, it's stuff. We want more money so that we can buy more stuff. Because we think if I can just get a little bit more money or if I can just get a little bit more stuff, then I'll be happy. Then I'll finally have enough. But guess what happens when you get a little bit more money? Guess what happens when you buy a little bit more stuff? It's never enough. It's never enough. And that's why we sang that song earlier. God is enough, right? God is all that we really need. And even for us as wealthy Americans, as followers of Jesus, God wants us to live with a generous heart. God wants us to live with open hands. The problem is, and we talked about this a little bit last week, the problem is that most Americans, even though we're wealthy, if you own a car, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people on the planet. So we are very wealthy as Americans. The problem is we're looking at the wrong standard, right? We're looking at the bigger house down the street from us, the newer car that just drove past us, the guy that's got nicer clothes than us, right? The girl that's got the new handbag that we really want. We're always looking at the wrong standard, we can always find somebody who's got more than us, and then it makes us want more. But when you compare what we have with the rest of the world, we are so blessed beyond measure. We are already so wealthy as it is. And so last week we talked about this idea of the scarcity cycle and how most of us as Americans are living with a scarcity mindset. We're living out the scarcity cycle. And what does that look like? What it looks like is we get some money, right? And then what do we do with that money? We get our paycheck, we cash it, and then what do we do? We consume. We are consumers. So we consume, and we buy stuff with our money, and usually we spend more money than what we should have spent. We don't save. We don't put some away for a rainy day. And we spend, and we consume, and then we start to feel like we're lacking. We have a lack. Ah, uh, you know what, I still, I don't have enough. I need, I need more, but I got to get more money to buy more stuff so I can be happy. And then when we realize we're out of money, 
we fear. We become afraid because we've run out of money and we can't pay all of our bills. And so it's a vicious cycle. And what, what we do is we self-medicate. And when we're afraid, the way that we medicate so often is we consume more. And we get a credit card. So even though I don't actually have the money, now I've got this little piece of plastic that says I can buy stuff. And so we buy more and we consume more and we get ourselves further and further into debt because we feel like we're lacking. So I've got to use credit to buy this because I really, 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 really need it. Even though really what it is is a want. You understand the difference between needs and wants, right? Every time I go to Walmart with my kids, they need a new toy. We just had a yard sale yesterday. We gave away like 100 toys. And they still have thousands more at home. They don't need more toys. So I, I keep trying to teach my kids, no, you want a toy. You don't need a toy. You've got plenty of toys at home that you do not play with. And we're no different as adults. We think we need something when the reality is we just want it really bad. And we convince ourselves that we need it. And so we use plastic to buy it. And we consume, and then we feel like we have a lack, and then we get afraid because then the bill comes due, and we don't have anything to pay. And so it's this vicious cycle that we're on, and it all starts up here. It all starts up here. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon's writing... And he says this, he says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a person thinks in their heart, right, it, it starts here. It starts in our mind, it starts in our heart. As we think in our heart, as we think in our head, so are we. Our thoughts are determining our future. And so the scarcity cycle, I just want you to understand this, it's important for you to understand that the scarcity cycle starts with your mind, not with your money, the scarcity cycle, if you're in the scarcity cycle, if you're, if you're on that vicious cycle right now, it's not so much a problem of your money as it is a problem with your mind. It's a problem with the way you're thinking. And so if you're sitting here this morning and saying, Pastor Thomas, you know, last week and this week we're talking about being generous Georges, and that sounds great, but I got to be honest, Pastor Thomas, I've been kind of living more like a, more like a selfish Sam, and so if that's you, then I want to just challenge you with this today. I, I want to challenge you to ask this question. Am I thinking the right way about money? Am I thinking the right way about money? And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to the Gospel of Mark this morning. A very, very famous story from the Gospels, Mark chapter 6. It's the story of the feeding of 5,000. You know this miracle that Jesus does where he takes some loaves and he takes some fish and he, he prays a prayer and he blesses it and then it just miraculously multiplies and everyone's fed. Now the feeding of the 5,000, which is usually what we call this story, is a little bit of a misnomer because at the very end, in verse 44, it tells us that it was the feeding of 5,000 men. That didn't include any women and children that were in the audience that day. And so most theologians, most Bible scholars believe that there could have been anywhere from 15 to 20 to maybe even 25,000 people who were there to witness this miracle that Jesus does, who were there and had their bellies full with the loaves and the fish. So the reality is, imagine like going over to Philadelphia and you're in the Wells Fargo arena, the Wells Fargo Center, and that building is full and Jesus is going to take five loaves and two fish, and he's going to feed the entire arena. Isn't that, an, isn't that an amazing story? Isn't that an amazing miracle that Jesus does? And the reason he's able to do that is because God loves multiplication. And so with that said, by way of backdrop, let, let's read Mark chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 34, and we're going to read down to verse 44. It says, when he went ashore, Jesus, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. 
And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. The big idea for the message this morning is this. I want you to write this down. What we subtract, God multiplies back. What we subtract, God multiplies back. See, we, when we think about giving, we usually think about that as a, a subtraction. As, yeah, I don't know. You know, if I give too much money away, if I'm too generous, then I'm not going to be able to buy all that stuff that I want. All that stuff that I think I need. But what we see over and over in Scripture is that when we're willing to give ourselves away, when we're willing to give not only our lives away, but but our money away, that when we subtract, that's when God steps in and He begins to multiply. He multiplies back. I've always loved this story, the feeding of the 5,000. I... I, in my mind, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I try to take like, I don't know if you do this, because, you know, sometimes we don't fully understand all the context and like all the culture that was taking place 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago when we read the Bible. And so sometimes in my mind, like I imagine like these stories like going down like in our day and age. And like what would that, like what would that look like if this kind of thing happened in 2019? And so I just imagine, you know, Peter coming up to Jesus You know, Jesus has just preached this sermon to all these thousands upon thousands of people that have come to listen to him. They they know that there's something different about this guy. He's doing miracles. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. And so they just want to get close. They just want to hear, like, what does he have to say? Who is this prophet among us? So they want to get close to Jesus. And so Peter comes up after Jesus has preached this sermon. He's He's like, Jesus, man, that sermon was lit, yo. That was awesome. He goes, that big idea, that big idea you shared with the crowd today, that is Instagram worthy. I am posting that on my feed today. That was amazing, Jesus. And so here's the thing. Jesus, it's getting late. I don't know if you've noticed, but the sun's starting to set. And we got a lot of people here who are hungry. Now, Jesus, listen, you know, I could do this all day. I mean, let's keep the service going. We don't have to end at 11.30. Let's, let's keep this thing going, Jesus. But, you know, everybody's starting to get, everybody else is starting to get hungry. Bartholomew, he told me he's hungry. You know, Simon, the other Simon, the zealot, that zealot guy, he's zealous for food right now. I mean, everybody's getting hungry. And I would imagine, Jesus, that all this audience, all this crowd, they're getting hungry too because it's getting late. And so, Jesus, you know, we need to send everybody home. We got to send them home because, Jesus, it's Sunday. The Galilee Chick-fil-A isn't open on Sundays. So we, got, we just got to send everybody home, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? We don't have to send everybody home. You give them something to eat. He says, look at, look at verse 36. It, Peter and the disciples, they're, they're saying, we got to send these people away so they can go into the countryside. They can go into the villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. You see, the disciples had a different mindset than Jesus. What was the mindset of the disciples? What's the word that they used? They used the word buy. That's our mindset. The disciples were thinking buy. The Lord was thinking give. We get our paycheck. What's the first thing we're thinking? Buy. The Lord's first thought is give. Two different mindsets. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And what were the disciples no doubt thinking in this moment when Jesus says that? What do you mean we're going to give them something to eat? We can't afford to feed all these people. See how many people are here? 
It was way too much money. But Jesus was thinking, just give and watch God multiply. Just give and watch God do the miraculous. And I think even today in 2019, even though the scenario plays out a little bit differently, our mindsets, more often than not, are still the same. We get our paycheck, we get our money, and we're thinking, buy. When Jesus is thinking, give. But what do we think? I can't afford to do that. I can't afford to be generous. I don't have enough as it is. I don't have enough money to pay the bills that I have. There's always too much month at the end of, money, end of the money. And we have this whole scarcity mindset. And God doesn't want you there. God wants you to experience the power of multiplication. God wants you to give first. Because as we learned last week, whatever measure of faith you give with, He can then bless that, press down, pack together, and then Pour it out into your lap, overflowing, over, overfilling you. He can give it back to you tenfold. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says this, Honor the Lord from your wealth. Again, we said last week, we don't think of ourselves as wealthy, but we are. And Scripture says that we're to honor the Lord out of our wealth and from what? The last... Of all you pro- like if you have any left over, if you have anything left over after you pay all your bills, after you've bought everything that you want, if there's any little bit of scraps left over, give that to God. Is that what it says? No. Honor the Lord with what's first. Honor the Lord first with all, with all of your produce. And then what's going to happen if we do that? And the only way you can do that is if you do that by faith, putting God first. So if you put God first, even with your money, he promises, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, as Baptists, we usually don't, we just skip that part, right? Let's not talk about the wine. Let's not talk about the liquor. He says, your barns are going to be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with with new wine. This is a picture, this is a symbol, an image of the blessing that God wants to pour out on his people. Look back at verse 37 of Mark 6. And they said to him, shall we go and what? Buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Now, A denarius, so we got 200 denarii, that's the plural form, but a denarius was basically the equivalent of one day's wage for the average worker in Jesus' day. So if you went to work and you worked all day, you got this coin called a denarius. That was your your pay for that day. So we're talking about 200 days worth of pay is what they're asking. Jesus, are we going to use... Basically, so if you, let's say today, if you work 50 weeks out of the year, you take two weeks off for vacation, 50 weeks times five days a week gives, I know we don't like math, multiplication, how many is it? 50 times five means you're going to work about 250 days, give or take a few sick days, you're going to work about 250 days out of the year. So if you take 200 denarii or 200 days worth of of wages out of 250, what percentage is that? Too much math today, Pastor. It's 80%. It's 80%. So we're talking about 80% of one person's wages for the entire... They're saying, Jesus, do you want us to use 80% of one person's entire year's worth of wages in order to feed all these people? Basically, they're asking, like, are we going to have, it's like having a wedding reception, Jesus. It's way too expensive. It's too too much money. Is that what you're expecting us to do, Jesus? To spend that much? That's how much money it would take to feed all of these people. We can't afford that. Jesus says, well, what do you have? 
The disciples are kind of freaking out at this point. How in the world are we going to pull this off? But again, it goes back to the two different mindsets. The scarcity mindset, which is where the disciples were and where probably most of us are, ask this question, what can I afford? Right, so I'm going to get my paycheck. I'm going to write out all of my bills or I'm going to pay all of my debts. I'm going to buy my groceries. I'm going to have a little money set aside for, you know, leisure and like going to the movies Which, by the way, we took our kids to the movies recently, family of six. It was like 80 bucks for movie tickets and a bucket of popcorn and one soda. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's robbery when you go to the movie theater. right? But we've got to put some money aside for fun stuff. And then we ask, well, okay, now that I've spent all of that, what can I afford? What can I afford to give? That's the scarcity mindset. But the abundance mindset, which Jesus had, asked this question, what do I have? What do I have? Jesus understood that little is much when God is in it. That just a little bit, coupled together with faith, coupled together with God's blessing, can go a long, long way. When I think about this principle, my mind, as I was preparing this sermon, went to two different stories in the Bible of two different widows. There's a story about a widow in the New Testament, and there's a story about a widow in the Old Testament. And I think both stories speak to us about this topic. The first is the story of the widow's might. Look at Luke chapter 21. Verses 1 through 4. It says, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, right? Into the offering plate, into the offering basket. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins, or the New King James, the King James Version says, it's, she put in two mites, these little copper coins. Basically, they think of like, like pennies. She put in two pennies. And then what did Jesus say? Everybody else was probably like laughing. (laughs) She just put in two pennies. How pathetic is that? Jesus had a totally different mindset. Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Because all the other people gave gifts out of their wealth. right? Just Just a small percentage of the vast amount that they had. right? The average American gives 2.8% of their annual income away. Just a small little percentage. And we think we did something great. And Jesus says, but look at her. She, out of her poverty, gave everything that she had to live on. Two mites. Might not have seemed like a whole lot. Basically two pennies. I remember when I was, when I was a kid, I used to hear my pastor talk about the widow's mite. And I thought, like, she must be working out or something. I don't know. I was was confused about what that meant. But she put in all that she had. We are like the rich people here in this story. Right? Just given tiny little bits of our wealth. But then Jesus sees this widow who, who is, like, we think we're poor. She truly was poor. She basically has nothing. And yet she, by faith, She's not just, you know, so, so many times we hear in church about tithing. She's not giving just a tithe. She's not even giving a reverse tithe. We talked about that last week with R.G. Letourneau. He decided he was going to give away 90% of his income and just keep 10 of it for himself. She's not even doing that. She's going even beyond that. She is putting in everything that she's got and trusting God to take care of her. That's amazing faith. And I just got to believe that she understood that, that what we subtract, what we give away from ourselves, generosity, blessing others, when God sees that faith, God multiplies. God multiplies back. What we subtract, God multiplies back. I've always wondered, you know, when you read this story in Luke 21 about the widow, and like what happened to her afterwards? You ever wonder that? 
And I just got to believe that hearing what Jesus said about her and knowing the faith that it took for her to give away everything that she had to live on, I just got to believe that God blessed her socks off. I just got to believe that God met her in her place of need, that God provided for her. Even though we don't know the rest of the story, I would love to have, what was that Harvey guy? That, that's the rest of the story. What was his name? Paul Harvey? That's the rest of the story? I, I would love to hear the rest of the story. And love to see what God did for this woman. Because I know that God blessed her. What we subtract, God multiplies back. So the widow's might, that's the first story that came to mind when I was thinking about this topic. But then in the Old Testament, there's another story about a widow. It's the, the story of the widow of Zarephath. And the backstory for this is that Elijah the prophet has announced and pronounced, and if you want to turn there to 1 Kings 17, Elijah has pronounced judgment upon King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. They are serving and worshiping Baal. And so as a result, God's going to bring judgment through drought, which leads to famine, which leads to no food, no water. All the animals are dying. All the people are dying. And this drought and this famine is taking its toll on Israel. But God supernaturally begins to provide Water in the Kareth Ravine for Elijah, first of all. Nobody else has got water, but there's this little stream, the Kareth Ravine, where Elijah is able to drink. And then the Bible says that ravens from Baltimore, they were flying all the way from Baltimore to Israel. And they were bringing food to Elijah. And, and not just bread, it says they were bringing meat each day. Elijah was not a vegetarian. And so they're bringing meat to Elijah, and he's able to eat, and he's able to drink, and he's able to sleep and rest because he's on the run. Uh, uh, Ahab and Jezebel, they have vowed to kill him. And so he's afraid, but God is providing for his needs, taking care of his man. But eventually what happens? The meat stops coming. The water dries up in the ravine. A little creek. And God tells Elijah, I'm not going to provide for you in this same way any longer. I've got something new to teach you. I've got somewhere new to take you. I want you to go to Zarephath. And when you get to Zarephath, Elijah, there's going to be a widow there. And this widow is going to provide for your needs. And so Elijah, what does he do? He listens to God. He decides to obey and to walk by faith, and so he goes to Zarephath. And we pick up the story in verse 10. It says, so he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go home, go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Scarcity mindset, right? All, all the food's running out. Don't know what to do. Don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. We're just going to make one last little meal, right? The last supper for me and my son. And then we're going to die. And Elijah said to her, you're not going to die. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, there's that word again. Don't make the food for you and your son first and eat it first. First, give to God. For, put God first. Make a little food for me. Bring it to me 
and then prepare the meal for you and your son. Don't be afraid to do that. I know you're afraid to give to God first, but don't be afraid to put God first. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. In this widow's story, you see a woman who has been consuming, like us. She's a consumer, and now she's run out. Right? There's too much month at the end of the money. She's been lacking. And now as a result, what has happened? She's consuming, now she's lacking, and so she starts fearing. She's afraid. And so the very first thing Elijah says to her is, do not fear. Don't be afraid. She is on this scarcity cycle that we've been talking about. What's the question she's asking? Elijah says, hey, can you make me some food? I'm hungry. What's her thought? What can I afford? I can't, I can't afford to give you food. If I give you food, there's no food left for me. There's no food left for my son. All we've got is one last meal to go, and then we're dead. Elijah says, no. That's not what the Lord says. She's thinking, I'm just a poor widow. I can't afford to give. I've consumed almost all I have, and there's basically nothing left. That's the scarcity mindset. But what is the mindset of Elijah? Does he have a scarcity mindset? No, he's got a mindset of abundance. What does he ask her? Not what can you afford. What does he ask her? What do you have? What do you have? All I got is this little jug of oil, little jar of flour, just a tiny bit left. That's all I got. What's Elijah say? That's enough. That's enough enough and if you'll give to God first if you'll put God first in your life even with the little bit that you have if you will give to God first by faith he will multiply because God loves to multiply and he will take care of you God loves to show off his power and that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 15. And she went and did as Elijah said. She was no doubt scared. She was afraid. She didn't know how this was all going to work out. I don't get it. The math doesn't add up. But she did. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent. Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken by Elijah. Isn't that an awesome story? This is what our God loves to do. He loves to do this. You go back to the story of the loaves and the fish. Jesus viewed this episode, this situation, through a completely different lens from the disciples. The disciples are asking, what, how, how can we possibly afford to feed 5,000 men? How could we possibly afford, how could we buy enough food for all these, this vast number of people? And Jesus is saying, don't ask what you can afford. Ask, what do you have? You're asking the wrong question. You've got the wrong mindset. Look at verse 38 in Mark 6. And he said to them, how many loaves do you what? Have. What do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, we got five loaves, we got two fish. Now, just track with me for, for just a minute. Five loaves of bread, two fish, <laughs> Small. 5,000 men, not including women and children, that's a lot, 
right? Maybe up to 20, 25,000 people to feed with five barley loaves and two little fish. That math don't add up. So the disciples are thinking, it's not enough. And Jesus is thinking, with God, little is much. With God's blessing. Jesus looks at that same situation and he's thinking, it's more than enough. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. The disciples were thinking, what's the point? All we can do is provide a couple loaves and a couple fish, but it's too small compared to the need. And Jesus is thinking, little becomes much when it's given to the Lord from a heart of faith and generosity. And that's exactly what Jesus teaches them through this little boy. This little boy that becomes an object lesson. Oh, that we would have childlike faith like this little boy. You know, this story, there's only two stories that appear in all four Gospels. You know what they are? The resurrection of Jesus. That's one miracle that appears in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There's only one other story that appears in all four Gospels. You know what it is? This story. The feeding of the 5,000. And there are little different little nuances and different little portions of the story that we read in each, each one of those accounts. But shame on Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they fail to mention the little boy. Now, obviously, God's in charge of all that. He's sovereign over the scriptures. I get that, right? But the little boy is important to the story because it's the little boy who gave up his lunch. It's the little boy who said, God, what I have in my hand is yours. Open-handed, generous heart. This little boy is the only one who thought I had to bring lunch. That's all the food they had in the whole place. Five loaves and two little fish. And this little boy with open hands says, Jesus, it's yours if you want it. Five loaves, two fish. So I think the boy deserves a shout out. John mentions the little boy. In John chapter 6, verse 9, it says there's a young boy here, right? The disciples are reporting back to Jesus. There's a young boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? It's not enough. Jesus, it's not enough. Many of us have that mindset. We think, you know what, Pastor Thomas, I hear what you're saying. I appreciate the, you know, the generous George, you know, play off of Curious George. It's cute. You wore a yellow shirt to go along with the theme today. I love it. It's great, Pastor. But listen, when I have more money in my bank account, let's talk. When I get my next pay raise, let's talk. When, when one of my loved ones passes away and leaves me a big inheritance, come back and talk to me then, Pastor. But right now, I, I just can't. There's not enough. It's a scarcity mindset. And I hate to break it to you, if you're thinking that way right now, if you're thinking one day, when I have more than what I already have, when I make more than I already make, one day I'll be generous. If you're thinking that right now, can I just be real blunt with you? You're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. Because the more we make, inevitably, our human nature kicks in, our sin nature kicks in, and we grip it even tighter. That's why we have to start where we are. Start with the little. Start with the five loaves and the two fish and be willing with open hands to say, God, I don't know how, how this is going to work out, but I give it to you. Everything I have is yours. It doesn't belong to me. God, if you want to use it, it's yours. What we subtract, God multiplies back. Now, really quick, as we wrap this up, I want to show you what you need to do in order to experience God's abundance. If you want to get out of that crazy cycle of scarcity and never having enough and having the wrong mindset about money, 
and come around to God's mindset of living and experiencing abundance, here's what you need to know. Abundance comes when we pray and give away. Lord, I don't know how this is going to work. God, I'm scared. Lord, you're going to have to step in. But Lord, I'm giving it's yours. Whatever you say, God, whatever you ask me to give, I'm praying, I'm trusting, I'm afraid, but I'm giving it to you. We pray and we give away. That's the abundance mindset. Look what happens at the end of the story in Mark 6, verse 41 to 43. And Jesus, right, he, he receives the loaves and the fish from the little boy. He looks up to heaven, and what does he do? He blesses it. He said a blessing, and he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided, he divided the fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied And they took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. See, the blessing of God over anything in our lives is a powerful thing. That's why we just did a whole series on prayer. Five weeks talking about the importance of prayer, the power of prayer. When we pray and when we live by faith, That moves the heart of God. Jesus prays. He asks for God's blessing upon this little meal, this this little, you know, basket of five loaves of bread and two fish. And when we pray and give away, that releases even more of God's blessing over every single part of our lives. Look at Mark, excuse me, look at Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. It says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds, right? I can't afford it. I can't give right now. I can't afford to give. I don't have have enough for me and my son. Elijah, how is this going to work? It doesn't work. The math doesn't add up. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. That's why last week I told you, and it's going to be the same life application this week. How do we make this practical? This is what I want to challenge you with. This is what I want to challenge you with. Add 1% to your current annual giving. Whatever that is, if you've been tithing for all these years, locked in at 10% because that's what the pastor told you to do, up your game by faith. Add 1%. Get along with God. Pray. God might want you to give away more than 1% more. He might want you to add 5% more. He might want you to double your current giving. But my challenge is every single person in our congregation I want to challenge you to step out by faith. And whatever. if you've been given 0%, give 1% to the Lord. And just watch God multiply. What we subtract, God multiplies back. You cannot outgive God. I said that over and over last Sunday. And it's true. You cannot outgive God. So add 1% to your current annual giving. No matter what that is right now. If you've been giving 2%, make it 3. If you've been giving 5, make it 6. 10, make it 11. Whatever your current annual giving is, by faith, step out. Put God to the test. He's promised that he will bless you. You will prosper if you live generously. I've invited Mike Martucci to come. Mike is going to come and share a little bit of what this has looked like in his own life. You know, since I've been the pastor here over the last 10 years, there have been some times where Roxanne's been without work. She's had to look for a new job. And there have been times where this family has had to live by faith. And so I've seen Mike actually live out this message. I've seen Roxanne and Mike live out this message in their own life. And so I just want you to hear a little bit about their story. Yesterday I was sitting at the pool playing with my granddaughter. And my wife says, Thomas just texted me. Did you get his other text? I went, no. 
I was playing. And I go home and I read the text. He goes, hey, would you mind giving your testimony tomorrow? And my thought was, why is he picking on me? You know, and that means I have to listen to the whole sermon today. I got to stay awake <laughs> to, 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 to make sure my testimony is good. Thanks, but, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. No, no but... A little thing I wanted to share with you. It was about 10 years ago, and my wife and I, you know, we both had good job. We both have good jobs, and she was working for an orthopedic firm, and, you know, me being an elder, and life was going good, and I said, you know what, Lord? And I never forget the prayer. Lord, I want you to break me. And I thought that was just going to excel me into a better spiritual relationship with God, and it did. But his idea of breaking me and my idea we're not the same idea at all. They just, they weren't on the same page. My wife lost her job. And that breaking period lasted about 14 months for us. And I saw the area that God needed to break me in was the same message that Thomas really did an excellent job on preaching today. It was, God, you're really starting to interfere with my stuff. I give to you. But I was realizing that what I was doing was giving God a tip like he was my waiter, not my savior. And it was that mentality. Now what are we going to do? We lost a whole income. Well, my mortgage doesn't go cheaper. My kids had a bad sin habit. They wanted to eat every day. <laughs> it was like, what more, God, could you do to me? When through that trial, our washer broke. Through that trial... One of our cars went down. And it was like, what more could you do? God goes, funny you ask that. Watch this next week. The pipe backed up and we had a flood in our kitchen. So I didn't ask that anymore. I'm like, what else? Because I didn't want to see what else. I didn't want to know what else. So I said to my wife, look, we, we, we really have to figure out what we're going to do with our money. You know, I thought we were good stewards, but we were not. I said, well, let's cut back our tithing. I'll never forget the conversation. Let's cut back the tithing. And when we get back on our feet, we're going to do it. And she says, no, we're not going to cut the tithing. We'll cut other places. Let's just stay faithful. And I know she was stressed out with bills and stuff like that. And it happens. But we remain faithful. And God provided through our good friends, Reed and Joe, who stepped up and helped us. And they never even knew, hey, we helped them. Are we going to get this back? That wasn't their concern. They stepped up and helped us. God provided every single step of the way. So what I learned was a valuable lesson is that there's two ways of giving to God. You can give sufficiently or you can give sacrificially. When you give sufficiently, the main focus of all your money is you. That's why God gets what's left. When you give sacrificially, the main focus is God. And here's the thing, what I've learned, and as, and as we got back on our feet and we prospered, we made sure that we continue on a sacrificial giving. And we still have ways to go. My wife and I still have ways to go on that. But we continue to move on that path because it's a, a joy, it gives a great joy that we can be able to do that. So I want to challenge everyone today because I challenge myself this way. Where do you fit in? So right around now, I probably turned 10% of the people off. They just stopped listening to me. And that's cool. You're, you give sufficiently, you're giving. Praise God for that. But when Pastor said last week, the first check should be written to God. Many of us do that. Probably everybody does it. But I want to challenge you on one thing. The day you write that check, make that the day you write all your checks. And then line them up. Well, let's see. God, $50. My new cell phone, $200. My cable, $150. My 401, <laughs> I need this. There's 20% of my income. And at the end of it, you're going to say, you know what, God? There's just too many other gods before you. I mean, I need this cell phone. I got to be able to Snapchat like that. I cannot be without it. <laughs> I need to be able to do it. I need to be able to, I got to go on Twitter. I mean, come on. I'm in work. I mean, in my half hour, and it's funny, sometimes I see, I know people are in work, okay? I know you get a half hour lunch. There's an hour and a half of Facebook postings. 
<laughs> you're, you're also a thief. But besides that, you're, you're going there, but I need this phone. You know I can draw on this phone. I need to take pictures on this phone. I need this, God. I know your church needs to exist. I know a pastor needs to be paid, but I need the phone. I challenge you. When you write that check, where does God's amount fall within you? Do you pay yourself more spending money than you're willing to give God? And that pricked my heart because when that happened to me, I said, okay, the first week of every month, I take my spending money and I tithe that. That's mine. That's my Starbucks money, man. That's my stuff. <laughs> God, you want me without coughing? And I don't have a raven to give me anything. But it's a challenge, and I want you to look at that. Brothers and sisters, my brothers in Christ, look at that. When you write that check out, look at the amount you gave God. Then look what you are paying yourself. Look at your, and now gas, electric, you, know, you need them to live. On, we need it. But is your cell phone bill higher? I need that cell phone. What about your charge card? And you're going to see every area where you can give more sacrificially if you eliminate the stuff area. And it was amazed what I found out when I did that. Yeah. When those checks got written out, God was the least important thing on my list. And it's embarrassing for an elder to say that. Hmm. It, for an elder to say, well, you know what, Lord? But Satan's conniving, and, he's, and, he, and he just turns you such a way that I didn't realize it. We didn't realize it. I told my wife and I said, we've got to be better stewards. I don't need all of this other stuff. But think about that. When next time you do that, put that check, but put all the checks down. Because if you don't, you lose sight of it. I gave to God my first amount. But what did I give God compared to everything else, which I consider unessential? Do you need a charge card? No, you don't. Do you need the latest, you know, $800 phone that, you know, calls Europe in a heartbeat? No, you don't. When you look at those bills, and then look what you're giving God. And just think for one minute. If you really think you need that, would you want God to supply your needs the same way? I'll take other things first. You know how much it costs to run a kingdom? How much to have streets of gold? I can't give you what's left over. But he gave, he gave that cross. Embrace that. One last thing. When you give sacrificially, I mean, when you give sufficiently, you show everybody that you know God's word. When you give sacrificially, you show everybody you believe God's word. And that's a world of difference. That made the difference in our lives, is that I had to believe God on his word, not know what he said, but believe it. Amen. Amen. It. Thank you, Mike. So I think what Mike shared is, was right on, the, right on the money. That was a, that was a bad pun. But we also, we need to start a new church uh, Snapchat account, let Mike... Like Mike head that up. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. We're going to sing, uh, sing one final song. We're going to get ready to collect the offering. But I just want to, I just want to remind you again, as we close this, this time together, that what you subtract, God is able to multiply. God's able to multiply it back. And so this is an awesome story. I, I, I challenge you to ponder this. What we've learned, don't just, you know, Write it off or throw your sermon notes away when you leave here. Really chew on this this week. Really think through this. Or go, go back over these sermon notes and ask God to show you, what is it that you require of me? Lord, what is it that you want from me? And just ask him. Just ask him. And I promise you, he will reveal it and he will reveal himself. He is faithful to do that. Let's all stand. We're going to pray. The ushers are going to come forward for the offering, and we're going to sing. Lord, we give ourselves away to you. Lord, we give our lives to you. We give our hearts to you. Lord, help us to be willing to put our money where our mouth is. Lord, help us to be willing to live generously. Lord, we have been blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. And so, God, I just pray that, that this week as we go out into our mission field, Lord, allow us to live with your grace in our hearts, and with hands that are open. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.